Welcome back. I'm Mike from the Rewatch Project and the Chin Stroker vs. Panther podcast. And I am a lifelong Trekkie watching Doctor Who for the first time. And not just any Doctor Who, but classic Doctor Who, the formative Doctor Who, the original episodes, the original Doctors, the pre Christopher Eccleston years. So, uh, Quick reminder that I always appreciate feedback, so please leave comments, uh, like and subscribe. Please share this with your friends in the Doctor Who community or otherwise. Uh, I'm a complete novice. I don't know very much about Doctor Who. Go easy on me. Uh, I really appreciate any uh, historical context or any behind-the-scenes uh, information uh, or answers to any of the myriad of dumb questions that I will ask during this. So uh, today we are talking about the third episode of An Unearthly Child. And uh, yeah, before we get into that though, a couple of quick bits of feedback from the YouTube channel. So I appreciate that those are starting to come in. Let's see what we have got here. Joshua, Joshua commented, welcome to the Doctor Who world. Without giving too much away on the Doctor's family, we know he has a granddaughter, which is Susan, but they never really went deep into specifics with his family and his background. It all to this day remains a mystery. So, uh, I think maybe it probably got to the point where they hadn't answered that. So I think that the mystery probably just became um, something that they were scared to uh, deal with. But I'll be looking uh, interested in seeing how that all plays out as we move forward on that. So thank you, Joshua, uh, particularly for your kind words about welcoming me to the uh, Doctor Who world. I'm very much enjoying it so far. And we've got a message from MWZ. DMZ Bloodhunt. I believe actually this is friend of the show Mark, who does the Good, the Bad, and the Odd podcast, which I recommend you checking out. Lots of Doctor Who coverage there. I could be wrong, but I don't think they repeated it as such. I think the cast did the whole live broadcast again. I think this is about the fact that the episode was repeated um, the following week, I think, because of the JFK assassination and how much that dominated the news. Uh, he goes on to say, I just checked, it was recorded before the first broadcast, but for some reason, they recorded it twice with different costume sets, etc. I got confused. Interesting. I'm wondering if both versions of that are available. That would be quite kind of an interesting little thought experiment to take a look at those. It reminds me a little bit about how in old Hollywood, um, they would sometimes shoot the same film twice with the same costumes and sets and script, but with different actors for the foreign language versions. I think maybe the, um, is it the Todd Browning Dracula? that I think was shot for a Spanish or Italian audience. Again, it's always interesting going and looking at those uh, different versions. Bin Rowe of the Heretics commented, uh, yes, it was for budget reasons that they stuck with the police box, which even came, I believe, from them strolling around the set bay that the BBC had and, and taking the set from a long-running 1955 to 1976 police series called Dixon of Dot Green. Yes, Dixon of Dot Green, that's definitely an incredible um, piece of BBC history there. So, uh, wow, yeah, repurposing, it is interesting to see how uh, I think I'm, I compared it a little bit to Star Trek and the whole not landing the Enterprise and using transporters to save budget, but then actually necessity being the mother of invention and that becoming a great thing. Ian Smith commented, uh, Hartnell wasn't as old as he looks. He was 56. Christ, that's only six years older than I am. That's kind of scary. Um, but made up to look around 20 years older. Oh, okay, I didn't know that. Although people of 56 tended to look older back in the day. That's what I tell myself too, Ian. But uh, no, that's awesome. Thank you so much, everybody there for the feedback. But um yeah, so we're on the third episode. Um, this is titled um, The Forest of Fear. So, um, yeah, let's get into it. Let's watch it. Some Doctor Who. Some techno DJ must have done a version of this. I'm guessing that there's some um, EDM versions of this. Uh... Okay, so here we are back in the, the Cave of Skulls. This is back before uh, the previously existed, the previously recap. I think they just show you the last couple of beats of the previous episode, just to bring you up to speed. Um, audiences had better memories then, I guess. Forest of Fear. The Temple of Doom. The Phantom Menace. Again, guys, interested to know about the background of these writers? Are they sci-fi people or drama people or just BBC staff? I found another piece. Do something. Help us all to get out of here. Yeah, Ian's definitely no. the protagonist no. here. It's, it's oh, interesting. Please. Doctor's kind of a bit of a Debbie Downer. They have to defend us. Good thinking. Classic. You're you're trying to help me. Fear makes companions of all of us. That's right. I never companions. You were afraid. Fear is with there all of us and always will be. Just like that other sense. I like that the companions are actually they're not useless. They are contributing. They're smart. They're capable. 
um, slightly at odds with the Doctor at points, but um, he's not having to baby them through the entire process. Um, hysterical fits from the younger companion aside, but uh, no, that's quite a pleasant surprise. Oh, there we go. Hysterical fits. Make five. It's, it's worth pointing out as well that, you know, we talk about Doctor Who being a children's show and being science fiction, but um, it, the horror elements are there from the beginning. I mean, I joke about the hysterical fits from the young companion for screaming and all that, but that, that's a very much a genre um, thing uh, that's here as well. So I like the fact that in a Grimm's fairy tale and, you know, even in relatively recent history with the Harry Potter books, there's always been these horror entry level um, goosebumps or, you know, whatever that might be. And Doctor Who very much already, uh, he, he has an important part in the history of that uh, sort of gateway uh, horror stuff. So, uh, yeah. And Hammer, of course, was a uh, contemporary force. Oh, dear. Did you see this? No. But she took your knife. I tell you, strange tribe will not be able to show you how to make fire if the old woman kills them. She should be the leader. If I sh She's manipulating. But then again, I suppose uh, cavemen were somewhat patriarchal. <laughs> I think well, it's reasonable okay. to say so. Uh, she has to be quite strategic there. here, I guess. Why do you tell me this? No. Easy now. I will set you free if you will go away. She doesn't look that old. Make fire. Fire. Will bring trouble and death. But then again, I am only six years younger than William Hartnell, so. Great stone. Great piece of polystyrene. That's a great 60s sci fi tradition as well. The having to act like you're exerting incredible physical force when you're moving something in actuality is extremely nice. It's, uh, love it. And caves, of course, as well. Caves are that great science fiction TV location. Star Trek Lower Decks recently did an episode about caves in sci fi, so it's a. Worth looking at. It's hard to keep track of all of this Machiavellian scheming and double dealing. Knowledge is power. I shall have to carry you. Oh, there's no need for that. It's interesting, isn't it, that that I think this is shows you how much times have changed. That I don't think that the um, the titular character in a TV show now would be um, necessarily a physical burden to. A more virile secondary character. That's it's really interesting that they felt comfortable doing this uh, and having the Doctor being an older man and everything that that involves. Um, yeah, that's 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 really compelling. I'm so childish. I'm not seen out. Brains, brains are not brawn. I can't remember. See, so his performance is pretty committed. I, I simply can't remember. We're free, Barbara. We're having to Think do essentially live with all of the technology running around them and the schedule, which I'm sure is insane. Is um. Yeah, they're doing a good job. It's aged well. The, perfor the performances have actually aged pretty well. More hysteria there. And again, I think it is really important to look at these things within their context. I know a lot of people look back on the, the 60s Star Trek and say, you know, um, oh, people talk about Star, Star Trek being forward-thinking, but, you know, Uhura was still... Uh, essentially a space secretary and the diversity wasn't that all of the principles were still white men and all of this and that's all true of course um, but at the same time you know through the lens of the time it was amazing that Uhura was there at all um, and it was a small but important step um, towards where we are today and I think that seeing the female characters in this being present and being intelligent um, is pretty impressive, but at the same time, it was still 1963 television, and this still does exist within a genre that has kind of its conventions. Uh, and also, this exists within several genres, which many, which have at their core the uh, the rugged hero, uh, the defender of, uh, of of women, and the screaming hysteria that goes along with horror films as well, and really is still there to this day, even though we have the concept of the final girl and all this sort of stuff. So uh, I think you've got to go easy on these sort of things. It's very easy for us um, as a modern, sophisticated audience to roll our eyes, but I think that that um, can be a little bit lazy um, a, a, a thing to do. And, uh, yeah, you have to you have to look at these things within their context. And then we'll be safe. Oh, Ian, what... <laughs> 
And the hero, the protagonist, Doctor Who himself, isn't exactly uh, physically infallible. Because that's the safest way. This power dynamic is really interesting. And I wasn't expecting this. I heard something when we stopped back there. Oh, sheer imagination. I mean, watching this sort of in a vacuum, out of context, you know, you would figure that Ian's the hero and um, the Doctor is a, a plot element who is kind of getting in the way. Blimey. That was one of the women. Huh? Must have scared the wits out of kids in the 60s. Like I say, the, the just the level of hysteria is must, would be really upsetting for a five-year-old. They followed us. Quick, quick over there. Particularly grown-ups as well, like grown-up school teachers. Um, you know, the, the adults not coping is um, quite a thing for a child to see. It's like the Hobbit hiding from the uh, Black Riders. Predator. Quite tense, this is. Very well staged. You know, TV still being relatively new as well. I mean, you know, learning that open-faced acting so it doesn't work on the stage. It's a new art form, new performance style. Humanist. I like you, Barbara. They should just let the women run both sides. Oh dear. Go and fetch some water for his wounds. What water is there? <laughs> what does fetch mean? Show me. Give me your handkerchief. What is this fetch? Yeah, he's in a bad way, isn't he? Hartnell's got great hair as well. I forgot to mention that. It uh, adds to the iconic, you know, silhouette of the character. Water comes out of the All right, now we're helping them. You're a doctor, do something. <laughs> Dude. Doctor Very misanthropic character at this stage. Haven't you realised if these two people can follow, these, or if any of these people can follow us, the whole tribe might descend upon us at any moment? Oh, tricky. Bit of a bit of a fluff with the dialogue there. Fair play to him. I mean, that's not easy to do, that stuff. Such quick fire. He's right. Detail. too exposed here. And there's no second take, we'll I guess. Poles, long ones, fairly straight. Again, you got you just gotta, you gotta hand wave this stuff. These people have long feet. Oh dear, it's gonna be a rumble. Fire. Zar is having a bad week. How can we explain to her? She doesn't understand kindness, friendship. She doesn't really have the luxury of that, though, Ian. We will make him well again. We will teach you how to make fire. In return. You show us the way back to to our cave. Good old fashioned colonialism going on here. It's like this if he doesn't get his own way. The collars and the tie as well. Very, well, very well designed characters. Today. Sets the precedent for the sort of, I guess, the, the visual panache of each of the doctors. They have their own specific look. Even I know that. Don't you rob me. What are you doing? Well, uh, I. I... I was going to get him to draw our way back to the TARDIS. Was he going to kill him? My goodness. We've been too long as it is. Is the stretcher ready? Yes. Wow. Right, you take one in. I, I had no idea that, that him, do you? this you was the persona the of, of well. Doctor Who. Uh, right. Now, move him over very carefully. Oh, 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 oh. Maybe he just doesn't get out much, oh, no. you know. Gently. Oh. Maybe, is it, maybe there's a softening of the character through his interactions with the companions. They bring out his humanity. I'm interested to see how that goes, or whether the show just reboots. I know sometimes early episodes of shows um, you know, backpedal this stuff sometimes. Or are there going to be more misunderstandings? Pretty pliable electorate in the cave person world. Fire maker. Okay, um, oh, that was awesome. Yeah, that was actually pretty tense at points. Um, I think maybe, you know, I've gone into this, I think, pretty realistic as to the means of production of the day in British television. Um, but I think maybe I've um, overcompensated a little bit there because, as I say, I think that the, the staging 
is really impressive. Um, I think that the performances are great. I think that there's an energy and a sense of fun. Um, the story is actually pretty engaging, considering how much of it um, is dominated by the machinations of the uh, the cave people. Um, and there's some really interesting stuff going on with the dynamic between particularly the Doctor and Ian, with the Doctor being this sort of somewhat like super smart, um, but kind of um, a caddish pragmatist and um, the humanity of the, uh, the school teachers being contrasted with that is something I wasn't expecting. And I'll be very interested to see where that goes. So yeah, I'll be back very soon to talk about episode four of An Unearthly Child, the first Doctor Who uh, miniseries or story. I'm not sure what the uh, terminology is for these, so I'll be interested to know. Again, appreciate feedback on the YouTube channel. Just leave comments, like, subscribe, share. Also, uh, you can email me at rewatchprojectpodcast at gmail.com. Also, don't forget to check out the Rewatch Project podcast with Hannah and Mike, uh, where my wife and I look at some TV shows uh, and, as the title suggests, do a rewatch of them. So, um, yeah, um, I'm looking forward to episode four of Doctor Who, uh, and I'm looking forward to your comments and insights uh, and any suggestions or recommendations that you've got. Um, around future episodes as well. But as I say, I'm just going to keep on trekking and watch, I think, probably all of the available Doctor Who uh, right through to... My goal is at least the end of the Sylvester McCoy uh, era as well. So I have a lot of Doctor Who to watch, and uh, I am I think I might end up becoming a fan of the show. We'll have to wait and see. Thanks. Bye.